Hey, greetings, family. This is Kyle Dixon here for another episode in the Grand Rising Collective podcast channel um, that we have for you today. Okay. So thank you all for the listeners who've been supporting us, who've been listening to us uh, up to this point. We know there's a lot going on outside in the world, and we just really appreciate you all's time and energy being spent with us and the comments and the encouragement and just we just give thanks, right? So we, I just want to acknowledge that for everyone out there. All right. So if you're not familiar with the Grand Rising Collective uh, podcast uh, episodes, uh, we are a platform that chooses to highlight people in the community and abroad, global. Uh, we're going to be people from Brazil. Uh, we're going to be people from South uh, uh, South Africa. Uh, we're going to be people from uh, certain places all over the globe, all across the U.S., and uh, again, it has no bounds as far as what we can accomplish. So, so Rising Collective Podcast, my name is Kyle Dixon. I'm an educator slash entrepreneur, educated for 20 plus years, entrepreneur for 15 plus years. And we create this platform to not only uh, entertain, but to engage, inform, and empower uh, our listeners. So with the term Grey Rising Collective, we chose that name because it is a term of endearment. Like, good morning, we say Grand Rising. Grand rising means to rise to the occasion uh, and be able to be grand, be excellent at what you do, despite obstacles, despite interference, despite challenges that may come your way. All right. So uh, I want to turn it over to my co host. Uh, without further ado, Kai, take it away, sir. Thank you, sir. It's always a pleasure, man, on and working with you. My name is Kai Day Bentley, and I think it's important that you understand who you're listening to as well as who's speaking to you. Having said that, as I said before, my name is Kaide Bentley. I'm the president and founder of an organization called Four T's, which stands for Teaching Teens to Think. The mission of the organization is to help inner city youth identify their inherent skill set, meaning what they do naturally, so they can use that knowledge and that skill that they discovered to excel in college, be it higher education, so that way they can lever that, leverage that education in regards to getting a job, establishing a career, and ultimately starting a business if they choose to. The demographic in which my organization targets is the ages of teens between 16 to 24 years old. My reason for being a part of Grand Rising Collective is this platform gives me an opportunity to scale that information out to the community or quote unquote neighborhood that consists of parents, community leaders, and of the such. So this way our conversations don't take place in a bubble. It exactly takes place among educators, among ourselves, entrepreneurs among ourselves, so that way we can inform the community to leverage the playing field. That's the long and short of it. As well as being the president and founder of an organization for T's, I'm also a professor at Fordham University, and I also sit on the advisory board at LIU. These two institutions in particular gives me the leverage that I need to better target those who are pursuing their master's and doctorate degrees to bring them back into the community to inform the city youth to, to, in other words, provide a trail or a pathway uh, towards education and success in entrepreneurs. So that's the long and short of it. I tend to talk long, but I'm going to cut it short because Kyle bring in another one. Kyle got another one today. We got a professor coming in. Kyle, please do the honor and introduce our professor that's here joining us today, brother, please. Indeed, 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 family. So we have a definitely a special guest for you today. A uh, good friend of mine, colleague, mentor in a sense as well, or Jegna, the word I want to use now, Jegna, because uh, that's more African-based. But uh, but this is a colleague, Professor Charles Fry. And uh, I'm not going to say too much. I'll let, I'll let him introduce himself uh, because he's definitely, uh, definitely a person in the community, in the educational field, uh, in the academia that has definitely had his share of stories, his share of challenges, but also many successes with many of the students he's taught over the years, and uh, he's had a great impact on the community as a whole. So, uh, so yeah, without further ado, uh, Professor Fry, welcome to thank the platform. You. Thanks you know. so much for having me, gentlemen, Mr. Bentley, Mr. Dixon, thank you. Uh, yes, why don't you guys just ask me some questions, and uh, you'll learn more about me as the questions come, and I'll answer them to the best of my ability. Okay, cool. All right. That's what that's what we do. 
as we do. All right, so Professor Fry, um, again, you know, I know of you, but uh, the audience, of course, does not. So please give us a background on, like, who, where you're from, who are you, how'd you get into education as a whole, and and, and really just that experience within the field of uh, teaching in the community. Well, um, I grew up in Harlem, or Hamilton Heights, as they call it now. Yeah. <laughs> Second Street and Broadway. Okay. It was uh, in reverse gentrification back in the 1950s. Uh, I did have the honor of going to parochial school, but of course the school I went to was now closed. Wow. Uh, I, I had, was, it, was it in the city? Yeah, I went to school with George Carlin. Oh, wow. Okay. On 121st Street. Wow. Damn, the comedian, famous comedian family, George Carlin. Wow. Okay. Yeah, and he always told it like it was. <laughs> even then? <laughs> even then. Um, well, he said uh, he only he, the only thing he ever finished in his life was parochial elementary school. He got, wow. thrown, he got thrown out of Cardinal Hayes. He got thrown out of the Marines. And, uh, and then he went into comedy. <laughs> uh, after I left court for Christy, my mother said I was becoming a punk. So even though I was accepted to Bishop Dubois High School, which is right up the street, she said, no, you got to go to public school. So I went to um, George Washington High School, which at that time was 50% black, no, 50% white, mostly Jewish, 25% Hispanic, Puerto Rican, and 25% black. So it was a good mix. Although if looking back on it, I'm trying to remember how many white kids I had in my classes because I think they were automatically shot to the AP and honors classes, of which I never partook, <laughs> no matter what my grades were. But it was cool. Uh, the only person of note that I went to high school with was uh, Rod Carew, the baseball player. But he didn't. He didn't. Uh, he never. He never played on the high school baseball team. He always played AAU ball. He used to work out with the baseball team, but he never played on the baseball team. But uh, he definitely, and he grew up on 151st in Amsterdam, from what I remember. Um, after that, I had a basketball scholarship to Colorado State. <laughs> My father said, oh, hell no. You're going right down the street to City College on 138th Street. It's free, and I can keep an eye on you. Mm -hmm. So uh, I went to City College which was a lot like George Washington, except at that time there were much fewer black, Latino, and Asian students. One time we were talking, and we figured it was out of the 12,000 undergrad, there was about 500 black, Latino, and Asian students on campus all together. Wow. Right. And if you were looking for somebody, if they were easy to find, they were either in the cafeteria and shepherd. Well, let's say they weren't in class. They were in the cafeteria in Shepherd. Hmm. They were in the snack bar in Finley, or hmm. they were upstairs playing cards in the card room. If they weren't in one of those three places, they probably weren't, unless they were in class, they probably weren't on campus. Hmm. Uh, black students were in, in the college in the spring of 1969, I think it was, decided that they had enough of the closed admission and they struck the college for three weeks, took over the South Campus. <laughs> they had five demands, which I should have brought with me, but I can't remember what the five demands are now. I have to send mm -hmm. them And it helped institute open admissions, which Columbia tried to get uh, uh, credit for, but actually the open admissions movement started at City College of New York. Uh, and it was amazing after that that you know anybody who had a high school diploma was then eligible to go to one of the CUNY schools. Before that, if you weren't a Sikh student, and I think there are only about 200 Sikh students on campus, you had to have an 80-something average and SATs and yada, 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 yada to go to City College. And uh, after that, uh, I went to Europe, went to a couple other places, came back. I heard that uh, you get, I could get a scholarship to NYU if I became a teacher, if I signed the paper saying I'd commit to three years of teaching. So I went to 
you and got my first master. And uh, after that, I tried teaching for a while, but in 1975, the city went through a financial crisis and they, they laid off almost all the city employees. Some people didn't go back to work for four years. Wow. I have a friend that's a cop, he didn't go back for four years. You know, my friend Larry Welch, the fireman, he got laid off. I mean, everybody got laid off. Um, yeah. And then the, if you Google the headline of the Daily News said, uh, President Ford, President Ford tells city drop dead because the mayor was trying to get them to give money. And then to, to go up the fed said no. So then after that, I started teaching. I came back. I started teaching at City College. Um, City College had this thing called a College Now program, but it was called something else then, whereby high school students could get college credit if they uh, had met certain criteria. They had to get a certain grade on the SATs, they had to pass the English Regents, and they had to have a certain average. Because the college was so crowded, they decided to have the classes at Randolph High School. None of the white professors wanted to go over there to teach because they thought the kids were bad, 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 bad kids. So mm -hmm. if I wanted to go over there, and I said, why not? How bad could the kids be? Kids right. um, a lot of the kids always said they'd never been in a school where they had so many black instructors. The principal, Whitey Taylor, made sure that the school had as many black instructors, black teachers as we could find. And all the comments. And the kids, after, you know, 20, 20, 25, 30, 40 years later, so they always remember that. That, you know, Randolph had so many black teachers. Um, and I, I worked there in the morning because actually the teacher, New York City, UFT pension is better than the, the TIA, the PSC pension. And so I worked there part time because you can't have two full time jobs in the city. I worked at the high school part time and I uh, worked at the college uh, part time. And that was uh, early in the year. And it's gone because I finally my grant ran out from City College about 1918. Mm -hmm. And I moved along. I was playing in a tennis tournament in Westchester. This woman comes up to me, it's a white woman comes up to me and says, Somebody said, you're a professor at City College. I said, I am, I was. She said, do you want a job teaching at Mount St. Vincent? And I said, why not? It's like two blocks from my house. <laughs> so I've been teaching an EOP program, which is the same as the H-E-O-P and E-O-P program. So I'm working basically with Hispanic and black kids who are the, the vast majority of my classes. And so I'm teaching uh, composition and literature as I did at City College and as I did at Randolph High School. Wow, wow. So wow. So much, so much in that. Okay. So let me let me let me unpack that a little bit for the family. So what Professor Rogers gave you just gave you a, just a nice lineage of like his his experience in, in teaching and just a new, be, a, being a New Yorker, right? I gotta put the little accent on a New York, right? So, <laughs> gotta put that on there. So, like I would say. I grew up, went to school, and worked in the same zip code. <laughs> How rare is that nowadays? Right. They said that what the average uh, commute for somebody is like what 40, 50 minutes to an hour? Yeah. The average commute right. now? Yeah. So so professor, like let me let me go back a little bit. So we talked about like the open enrollment, like admissions, because that was definitely one of my questions was going to be in reference of college tuition. And also, I'm gonna go to the other question later on as far as the black teachers, teachers of color, Latino, Asian, et cetera. But in reference to now, like students now, open enrollment, admissions to schools, being able to graduate from certain schools, but also with that tuition, like what did that mean back then? And like, how does that, how does that tie into now with the whole well, issue with tuition costs? Well, the city college, the city university was free from 1847 to 1975. Okay. Which coincidentally, in 1975, the enrollment tipped from 49% minority to 51% minority. 
started to, uh, charging tuition. It wasn't very much, but it wasn't free. Mm -hmm. And it's quite the best education you can get dollar for dollar, pound for pound. Wow. How much, do you remember how much it was? Like the actual amount? Just to kind of give us the reference. I'd, I'd have to look. Okay. But when I went, it was free. You had wow. what's called a bursage fee, which I think was $50. Okay. So basically, you paid the bursage fee and you paid for your books, and that was it. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Um, I was very surprised. Kyle, I don't mean to take from No, no, go ahead. Uh, it's funny that you mentioned that at that specific school that a lot of the white teachers didn't want to teach there because they were afraid. And you had a lot of black educators there. It's funny how we're facing an epidemic now where in a lot of these inner city schools, you have more white teachers there than black teachers. Mm -hmm. And the effect that it's having on students. How important, in your opinion, do you think it is that there be black educators or educators that look like the populace of the students teaching courses in the schools, one, and number two, the transition of actually teaching real history? Mm -hmm. Because we growing up, we weren't taught about the various contributions that our ancestors contributed to the world today. So it's a right. combination of question, Professor Fry, I'm asking you. Okay. How important do you think it is okay, well, that there be black educators who resemble this class popular teachers? Right. That's that's a good question because I didn't have any black teachers in elementary school. Mm. Only black teachers I remember from high school were all phys ed teachers. I don't remember. I think there was one, I don't know if she was where she was from, but she was brown skinned Spanish teacher in high school. And then City College is where I really learned black history. Um, I remember I had, I had a, a history book when I was in elementary school, and it devoted one paragraph to slavery. Wow. And, and so that was a double column, you know. For how? So, oh, yes, it was slavery in America. But when I got to <laughs> page. Right, turn the page. So right. When, when I got to college, uh, people, at that time was, I guess, the middle of the civil rights movement, or the civil rights movement was just blossoming. Mm -hmm. And everybody wanted to know more about black history. And there were books out there, but they just weren't, we didn't know about them. Libraries always had these books. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about the Schomburg, I'm talking about other libraries, but a lot of libraries had the book, but nobody ever came in to ask for them because they didn't know the books were there. But in about in the middle of the 60s, People started asking for the books, and so they had to they had to keep they had to keep quote unquote black books in the library. And mm -hmm. when they asked me to come on the program. I remember I think the first two books that I read on black history. I don't remember who recommended them. Also, sidebar: there was a lot of radical white teachers at City College, mm. and City College they said was the bastion of socialism and communism in America. In the fifties and sixties, wow! And the white teachers were—they they, they, they was they, they got handled as being socialists and communists. But they were—they were actually I loved them, you know. Uh, as a matter yeah. of fact, the head of the W.E.B. Du Bois Club at City College was white. Wow! <laughs> really? Yeah. Man. So, um, but like they had a lot of black they had the Onyx Society, you know, they had a lot. But anyway, I remember the first two books was uh, From Slavery to Freedom and Before the Mayflower. Mm. And I think so those, right, uh, those are the first two books I read. And then after that, you know, I just, I looked at there, there another book called A Black Book, which I still have in my, in my library. And, uh, you know, I just started, and a lot of these books were written, I mean, Richard Wright, Richard Wright's books were, were written in the 30s and 40s. Mm -hmm. But, you know, but I didn't know about them. You know, wow. I know about Black Boy and Native Son. Uh, James Baldwin wrote uh, Go Tell It on the Mountain in the 50s. But, you know, I didn't know about it because nobody ever talked about it. Wow. You know? And remember, you get a lot of information on TV. So a lot of, t you know, I remember <laughs> in the 50s, if somebody black was on TV, my, my parents would come, look, look, there's colored people <laughs> on TV. <laughs> <laughs> 
and it's not and it's not like yeah. we, it's not like we had a color television but it was right. still, it was still, they were just gray but we run in the, the living room and uh they had the same black people in all the programs and, you know it was lena horn uh nat king cole mm. uh, and who and, and, and a couple of other people so it's kind of funny so quick sidebar nat king cole got in trouble because some white woman it might have been Julie Andrews or something. He always sat at a um, a, a baby grand piano, and you know it has that curve there. Well, yeah. When she finished singing, she reached over and she took she put her hand out, and he put his hand up just like the oh yeah, that was good. They were going to take him off the air. Wow! Just touching hands. Just touching hands. Wow. Yeah. How? How? Um, how yeah. How different do you think your life would have been had you had been exposed to the contributions of African Americans before college? Had you been exposed to that information in high school, how how different do you think your life would have been? Mm. Well, that means that they would have had to have Afri Afro Afro-Am studies in high school, and then I, I wouldn't have had been introduced to it in college. Mm. Now you guys aren't going to believe this, but I actually attended the march on Washington. Wow. I didn't, know, I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know what it was. But my father said this lady on her job had bus tickets to go down there. And uh, she had a daughter, too. I remember that. And my father said, you're going. I was like, yeah, the bus leaves at 7 o'clock in the morning. So I don't care what time it leaves. You're going to go down to, I think, 135th and Broadway and mm. take to go down to March on Washington. I was walking around in the haze. I didn't know. I knew all these black people. I'd never been around that many black people in my whole life. <laughs> and this is, this is this is August 1963. And I'm going, mm -hmm. where did all of these black people come from? I never <laughs> seen that many black people. Now different people were speaking, but it was like an echo through the through the through the, the speaker system. But it was yeah. clear. But and I could kind of see who was on stage, but I didn't know who they were. I think Harry Belafonte was there. Yeah, um, Mahalia Jackson, um, Bayard Rustin. Um, you know he was gay, right? Right. right. And he caught hell for that. Yeah. yeah. Did, didn't him and uh, Clay Powell have a little thing like the like a a, a beef or something? Right. Yeah. So um, that's right. Adam Clay Dupont was there too. Okay. Um, a. Philip Randolph was there. A. Philip Randolph. Yeah. I, if I'm, I don't remember if this is the truth or not. I'm trying. I got. I should fact check it. Somebody told me years and years ago that James Baldwin was supposed to speak, but they were afraid to let him speak because they had no idea what James Baldwin, you know, Malcolm X said, you guys took a march and turned it into a picnic. Right. You know? this and uh, they didn't want James Baldwin to speak because, you know, he could be rather, you know, well, you know, Baldwin, you know how he was. Yeah. They didn't I mean, hard. Harlem. I mean, you know, he's 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 saying it straight without any straight chaser, straight. straightforward. Yeah, straight no chaser, straightforward. Eloquently. Very, very eloquently. I'm not your Negro film. Everybody should go watch right. that. that. Oh yeah, right. Man. And um, so they didn't let him speak. And somebody told me, I don't remember, that Burt Lancaster, the actor, mm -hmm. actually read the speech that they had prepared for James Baldwin. I give you Mr. Bert Lancaster. All Americans traveling no matter where in the world today are in the position of ambassadors and are very often made bitterly aware of our country's reputation. It is not easy to be an American abroad, nor is it easy to make coherent to those who are not Americans the nature and the meaning of our struggle. And we are therefore forever indebted to those Americans represented by the March on Washington movement for giving us so stunning an example of what America aspires to become and for helping us to redefine in the middle of this dangerous century, what is meant by the American Revolution. 
we recognize that it is not only in America that the battle for freedom and dignity of peoples is being waged. The struggle toward freedom on the part of the previously subjugated is occurring in capitals and villages all over the world. It is on our awareness of what this struggle means and in the degree of our dedication to it that our futures and the future of the world depend. Wow. Now, I don't know what Jay, I don't know what Bert Lancaster was doing there, but, that, yeah. but I don't remember. Somebody has to fact check that. But that, you know. Wow. Dang. Yeah. Cause, yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, there was so much <clears throat> issues about the march. I heard, you know, from reading, of course. Oh, yeah. That, 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 like you said, what Malcolm said, it turned into a picnic. It was supposed to be like this radical kind of taking over. They were going to uh, shut down Washington. Huh? It started out, they were going to shut down Washington. Yeah. You know, and my father's side of the family is from Washington. So my oh. father, if something crazy happens, you make sure you call your aunt. <laughs> like I, that, I can find a telephone. That sounds so familiar. Right. That's black folks. Like if something go down, you know, you got your, your, your extended cousin and blah, blah. So make sure you call <laughs> your aunt. Because you see, you know, on television, you, you, you'd heard or you see pictures like in Amsterdam News of mm -hmm. um, people getting beaten down south. But it yeah. wasn't until that March Bloody Sunday on the Edmund Pettus Bridge that yeah. you saw it. You know? And I think I don't not somebody told me this, I'm not sure. It was actually an accident almost. There was only one cameraman there. From when really? yeah, there was he was just there was one guy taking pictures. Wow. Right. It was just a coincidence that he was in the right that he was there in the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. So he went to some place, they put the pictures on a bus or a train and then flew them up to up to Washington and New York. And that's how people saw it Sunday night. Wow. People don't realize like how how important those black newspapers were. Like, you know, Chicago has Chicago Defender, you know, me being and living in Chicago. The one, and then, like, the one in Pittsburgh was a big one too. Like. Was it Pittsburgh Courier? I, I want to say that, yeah. Yeah, I think it's Pittsburgh Courier, right. And then the Amsterdam News here in New York, like those were Right. Premier yeah. publication right. just find out like what was really going on in, in black neighborhoods all across the nation. Right. Right. You know, I think it was uh, a black paper in Brooklyn too, but I'm not sure. Okay, okay. And and Professor Fry, like since we're on on the topic of like the civil rights, you know, with the two uh, two found found fund well, for not even fundamental, but just two large figures as far as in like the civil rights movement, John Lewis and C.T. Vivian. Um, could you speak on them as far as like their legacy, like what it meant to you? Because I mean, I, I've never met them. Like I know friends of mine and colleagues of mine who've met them in passing you know, at events and things. And John Lewis is a Fiskite, Fisk holler, you know, Fiskites in the, in the building. But uh, I never got a chance to meet uh, one of the two gentlemen right. at all. So. I knew who they were and um, I, I read about them in books, but I never saw them. I saw John Lewis actually the TV show that had the most black guests. What's the uh, name? He's still alive. Dick Cavett? Dick Cavett? Yeah, it was on the Dick Cavett show. Okay. And I, I think John Lewis, I saw John Lewis on the Dick Cavett show. But the, remember, the rest of the other, the big, quote unquote, big civil rights people, they sucked, mm. they sucked up all the light. <laughs> so, you know, they go to Martin Luther King first. Yeah. Right, and then when Malcolm X was alive, they ran to Malcolm X just so they could get an opposing viewpoint. Mm -hmm. You know, start a fight and then go back and forth. Adam Clayton Powell was on TV all the time. Okay. Uh, what's his name? What's, I think there's a black minister at Riverside Church for a while. Uh, Maybe I think his last name was Proctor. Proctor. He was on TV once in a while. Okay. Then that was a black woman from down south. She was on TV, and she made this statement when, when about the voting rights and being they wouldn't admit her to the was it the nineteen sixty four Democratic convention? Yeah, uh, Penny Lane. Yeah, she and then her she was on TV. Yeah. What about Ella Baker? What about people like Ella Baker or uh, um? Not real. Not real. No. no. Okay. Remember, they didn't have black people on TV. 
You know, yeah. no, first of all, there was no black hosts. And it's a horrible thing to say, but you know, not that you know, white people weren't awoke, is that saying now? Right, right. <laughs> and if they were, they only knew, you know, the big people. And mm -hmm. uh, anybody too too militant. Right. Because that, you know, they'd like, you ain't gonna have him on here again. Mm -hmm. I think the only show that the James Baldwin was ever on was with um oh, what's that? The, guy, the white guy, he's really well spoken. Oh, which one? That's the cat. No, no, yeah. no. Um, yeah. Mick, 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 oh, what's his name? He always smoked a cigarette. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, that one I don't know. Yes, you do. Oh, my God. Not Milton. Not Milton, bro. Not no. Milton. Uh, Buckley? Is it, is it Buckley? Oh, yeah, yeah that one. Buckley. It's Buckley? Yeah, William F. Buckley. Okay, William F. Buckley. Right, so people would be on that show. But that that was it. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of black people on TV. Um, I remember one I was watching television, and they had Willie Mays and Henry Aaron on at the same time. Oh, wow. And I thought that was pretty amazing, because they never did that. They have both of them. I can see. I can see how that would be like a, a rare TV moment right there. Right. From what, you're, from, what you're, from what you're telling us, like yeah, definitely. Wow. You know something? You're not going to believe this, but I can't. When I was a kid, I would swear that who was the guy, the black guy that went to the uh, North and South Pole with the Admiral Perry? Uh, Matthew Henson. Not Matthew Henson. Matthew Henson was on the Ed Sullivan show. Really? Before he died. Wow. I've never heard anybody say that before because you know that's taraji henson's i think great 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 uncle or something like that but he was on that, he was, right and i remember him because he he was he was a short guy and then recently in the past few years um i read about him he was an incredible person but you know they never tell our story right <laughs> right they don't <laughs> even if he got to the north pole first right <laughs> Exactly. Look, he found it for someone else to claim it. Here you go. Like, right. you, know, so like, you know, we're sticking this flag here. Right. Even, though, even though Matthew Henson's foot is here. We're gonna... <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, sure. And, um, but if you read his biography, yeah, I mean, it was really incredible. He, he did, a, you know, after he came, you know, the thing is that we only get the highlights. Mm -hmm. We got to dig deeper to find out what the people really did. Right. I mean, Professor Fry, like, you know, talking with you on a number of occasions and just like my other family members and Kati and us speaking, like you really you really come to the to the conclusion that a lot of these black folks, brown folks who have who achieved like the first were really like dynamic people. You know, like people think that they're all they just they were just smart and they were just this. And they achieved and they were first. But like you say, you do you do the backstory and you find out like, wow, this person may have accomplished this, but then they were like really great at something else too. And you're like, wow, this this person was really dynamic. Like they really have a multi-talents that right. they could have pursued if not for racism right. and oppression. Right. You know, like Jackie Robinson could have played football, he could have played baseball. I mean, he could have played a, a, a basketball, yeah. but he could have been a track star. Right. He could have been a right. You know, but he about his brother, who he said was a better athlete than he was. And he was. Yeah. Wow. And yeah. he was a garbage man. Yeah. <laughs> Family, y'all should definitely check out the Jackie Robson uh story, the movie, the first one. Like I think it was like 1960s, I want to say. It's black and white. What about the one that he is in? Yeah, the one he's in. I came out in 1951. Okay, see, thanks, see, thank you. <laughs> nice to do. And, it, and, and it's it's an eye opener. That, but, uh... <laughs> it's an eye opener, seriously. Like, right. oh man. So much good. Hey, Mac. What are you doing at this time of night? I fixed you some lunch. Here, catch. Man, that's really smart signal calling. I thought you'd be hungry. I'm always hungry. Is it a while? Sure. Anything bothering you? I want to quit college. Right after the basketball season. 
What for? I gotta get a job. I want to marry Ray. School's one thing, but you and Mom can't support Ray, too. Can't wait till you graduate. What good will a degree do me? They're not hiring color football coaches. Not our color, anyway. Don't you want to play baseball this season? What good will that do me? Baseball's one sport they'll never let me in. Yeah, that's your best sport, too. I wonder if there's any place where they will let you in. There's one place nobody draws a color line. Yeah, great job for a college man. May not be a great job, but it's steady. Mm -hmm. so Professor Fry, how has education changed? Since when? Last week? Pandemic? <laughs> 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 it changed a whole bunch since last, just last week. In context to when you were growing up, the civil rights movement compared to where we are now, how has it changed? Has it become better or has it become worse? Well, I don't, I don't think it's a matter of better and worse. I think it's a matter of what you expect to get out of education, mm -hmm. both of education are. And I think that when I, when, I, when I got to college and my wife was in college, we just expected, we demanded things from educators. Mm. And people just don't demand anymore. People kind of settle. And that drives me out of my mind. You yeah. know, you go to parent teacher night, three parents are there out of a class of 25 kids. I know parents yeah. work, but, you know, I don't want to preach, but you have kids. Those are your children. You know, those are your responsibility. Okay, you get them dressed on Sunday, you get their hair done, you buy them a pair of $200 Nike sneakers that are about mm -hmm. this big, and you take them out and you sell them off. That's not raising your kids. You know, my kids hated us when they were growing up. <laughs> they hated us. They were like, well, we're going to go out to the park on Saturday. I said, you think so, huh? <laughs> 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 they, they went to Dance Theater Harlem. From there, they went to the Y. From there, they went to Riverside Church. From where they went to Church of the Masters. And then from there, you know, I picked them up, and then, you know, we got something to eat and came home. You know, Sunday, they could pretty much do what they wanted to do, but they couldn't leave the neighborhood. And in those days, <laughs> you had to know the parents of the kids before you would let your kids play with, your, your kids play with those kids. Mm -hmm. that's, how, that's how my parents were. That's my parents were the same. My parents were on that. So oh, yeah. that's old. I guess that's old school. Yeah, I wasn't staying at anybody's house. I wasn't playing right. with anybody. Kids on, a, on like on extensive, like going in the yard, like like until they knew who right. those folks were. Right. And uh, I remember going on cookouts, and we weren't allowed to eat anybody else's food. <laughs> so our parents <laughs> were okay. <laughs> 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 you know, <laughs> and one of the rules they had was um, never eat double, deviled eggs and no potato salad after May. What? Yeah, I can see that. Cause think, look how hot it is right now. You eat potato salad and mayonnaise? Nah, I'm cool. <laughs> I'm good. Yeah. I, I, I see that. No, I'm not. And plus, you know, when children get sick, man, that's a oh yeah, oh big ordeal, man. <laughs> They would make a plate for us, and then we had to ask our parents, "You say, are you on one seconds?" And so our parents were like, "Okay, we'll give him the seconds." And that would, you know, you had to ask for everything, and you had to eat everything on your plate. Well, at home it was different, but on picnic, you you ask for certain things, and that's what you ate. And then, uh, uh, and that that that's just the way it was then. That's the way it was. You can answer the phone at home. <laughs> <laughs> Like a dog looking at a bone, you know. <laughs> no. So the, the, the rule used to be you let the phone ring 10 times before you hung up. So your parents would pick it up on the eighth ring. Uh, who is, hello? Hi, this is Kyle. Can I speak to Chuck, please? Certainly. How are you, Kyle? Okay. Um, I don't hear any noise in the background. Are your parents home? Oh, they're in the kitchen? Oh, okay. Tell them I said hello. Well, I will. No, no. Tell them I said hello now. <laughs> right. and, and hold, and hold the phone so I can hear your parents reply. 
<laughs> oh wow! But that's the way. Where that, you, you know. So, where do you think? What changed, man? What changed from yeah. how that structure was that helped us to a large extent to where we are now, where kids are cursing at their parents, they on right. the phone in front of their parents' face. I mean, you would think that they're their friends and not their child, and vice versa. What happened? Okay. That's the other thing. People think, like I said, they dressed a little kid up with the, the sneakers and whatnot. They want the kids to be their friend. Mm -hmm. you know? And then the, the, I saw this movie, this Swedish movie, and it, it, I forgot the name of it. It was on HBO and Netflix, where the woman is the teacher, and she's having problems with a kid. And they called, she, I don't know, she cursed the kid out or beat the kid up. I don't know what she did. Mm -hmm. And they called her down to the principal's office. And she's sitting there like, so then the, she says, what she said, I just want to ask the parents a question. And she changed the turn to the parents. And she said, if you and your kids would, if your kids, if you're the same age as your kids, would you be their friend? Would you be your, mm. friend? Would you be your son's friend? Mm. No one right now sitting over there, would you be his friend? Good question. Of course, great question. And the answer would be, oh, hell no, that little monster. <laughs> yeah, parents know who their children are, and this is right. you know, and children know who their parents are actually. Right. You know, even if they don't, even if they can't verbalize it, they. Right. Right. You know, but and, and, you know, I don't know. It, I think what happened was, and I, you know, I, and it, it's kind of sense. You know, they, there's no more dress codes in school. You can bring mm -hmm. what, wear whatever you want. Mm -hmm. uh, oh. <laughs> I mean, schools, you never had to wait public school, right? Yes, there was a dress code, but everybody conformed to it. It was like getting a polio shot. That's why nobody ever got polio, because everybody got a polio shot. There was no need for a dress code, because everybody dressed the same way. You know, there was, there was no crazy clothes. Nobody sold crazy clothes. Hmm. You know, you, well, could, you couldn't wear sneakers to school, because nobody wore sneakers to school. You can't uh -huh. In your gym bag, when you went to gym, you put your sneakers on. After gym, you put your shoes back on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my pops and them tell me about that. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, that's the way it was. Yeah. But then you know they loosen the dress code a little bit. You know, people got you know. I remember my 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 daughter wanted a pair of Clyde's. Tomorrow, pool Clyde's. Yeah, because those were the only sneakers that came in color. Yeah, yeah, they came in many colors. Yeah, the Puma Clyde's classic, classic sneaker, especially New York for sure. Clyde's to match your outfit. Okay. And I think they were like twelve, fifteen dollars then. They shared about, they shared about four pair, and um, it was cool, but you know, she didn't have any hoochie coochie outfits. Well, she had one, but <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> no. That's yeah. Going back in there and do whatever you got to do, but you're not wearing that, you know. So, but, but everybody, you know, people, you know, your kids were your responsibility. You raised your kids. You didn't let other people raise your kids. You know, you drove your kids. Go to the movie. Put them in the car. Take them to the movies. Walk into the movies. You're standing outside when they come out, and mm -hmm. they didn't show R-rated movies during the daytime. Wow. Yeah, right. The movies that were considered R-rated, they showed at night. But remember, there was, also, there was no sex in movies until the early 70s. Before that, so yeah. Right. Because the, the husband and wife, I remember like I Love Lucy, they right. slept in separate beds. Right. Yeah. That, you know. Yeah. Donna Reed show, all that stuff. Yeah. Right. Right. Dick Van Dyke. Yeah. Right. So that's the way it was. And then... You know, a lot of people blame the change in society on black music. I said, Motown? Right. <laughs> Motown? That bubblegum music? But they, just, you know, they never blamed it on Elvis Presley, who stole all the black music and dance. Oh, boy. Oh. Yeah. 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 When, when Chuck D say Elvis never meant to me, right. you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. Do you know, do you know, back in the, the in the early '60s when Motown albums started coming out, the artists could not be on the cover of the album. I remember about that. I, matter of fact, I was in a Five Heartbeats. They mentioned that they kind of alluded to that, right. in to like one of their uh, album cuts. They had the, the white boys on the on the uh, on the front of the cover instead of the group. No, they had no, nobody was on the cover. Oh wow! 
it'd, it'd be Temptations and a list of their songs on the album. Right. And wow. I was four tops and a list of their songs on the, Stevie Wonder, right, and a list of their songs. That's wow. Because they, they, they were afraid that the white, the, the white kids would go into the white music stores and buy the album, but they were afraid there'd be blowback if the, the, the kids took the album home and the parents saw the black people on the go, oh my God. You know? And that and that probably didn't, I think that lasted all the way through Michael Jordan. You know. There was no you know, you didn't have there was no black out of uh, uh, posters of you know, white kids didn't you couldn't have a black poster of a black black athlete in, in your wall. I was so happy with Larry Bird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they ever had that J though. I give, I give that. <laughs> yeah, that J. I, I give, I give that. I'm not a Larry Bird fan at all, but I, 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 I get that. But so first of all, would you say to stay on this subject real quick? Would you say like the Dr. J before Jordan was like the first kind of black athlete that crossed crossed over hmm. to? White. No, 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 no. The first athlete to cross over was a football player. Mm -hmm. And we all know who it was. Jim Brown? No. no. O. 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 The juice. The juice. OJ. That's OJ all day. Man, they love themselves some OJ Simpson. Yeah, the juice. The juice. Coming or going on a business trip, you've got no time to waste. And nobody knows that better than Hertz. Whether it's picking up or dropping off your Ford or other fine car, nobody has more to do it faster. Go, okay, go. Gaming, gaming up with Super Speed. Gaming, gaming up with Super Hertz, the Superstar Inventor Car. Hertz, the Superstar Inventor Car. He was the first. He was the first. Yeah. Married to a black woman. Married to a black woman too. First yeah. time. The crossover. Okay. They, they loved OJ and Mark, and they they used to they used to work for Chevrolet. First time I saw OJ Simpson was the is the car show at the the old Coliseum down on 59th Street, and he was with his wife. They had a big contract. OJ had was in like every TV commercial. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Jump, jumping and jumping and running. Right. <laughs> Hurts. Hurt. I remember the Hurts commercial. Yeah, Hurts, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember the Hurts commercial. Hurtling over bags and whatnot. Right, right, right. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. OJ, OJ could do no wrong. Man. It's a hilarious scene in um, the TV show Mork and Mindy when uh, they, 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 rest, they arrested Mork and he goes to jail. And is this this guy? He was a funny guy named Ex Exodor, and he happened to be in jail, but he had his back to the to Mork when he when he's, they, he goes into the cell, and then um, Mork says, "Who are you? What are you doing here?" And he turns around, and he's got on like a a, a beads, but instead of beads, it's oranges, and he says, "I've given I've given my soul over." He says, "Over to who?" He says. I now pray for the juice. <laughs> you, can, you, can, you can see it on, I swear, you can go to YouTube and watch it. Yo, <laughs> God, we got to look that up. <laughs> you gotta, so, okay. Until I found him. Who? Mark. I worship O.J. Simpson. <laughs> Isn't he a football player? A football player? Mark, he is the football player. Tell me, did you ever see the Reverend Ike streak down the sidelines untouched? Did you ever see Billy Graham snake over from the two? Did you ever see Oral Roberts juke a linebacker out of his sock? Sure, 
Moses walked across the Red Sea. But could he have done it on AstroTurf? I believe in the juice. You too can be a born-again Simpson. Let O.J. show you the way. Just look at my followers. Look at the peace and serenity in their eyes. There's Isaiah. I... Merlin. Howdy. Too tall. Whoa. Bubba. My man. These more are my conversions. Conversions, good for one point. Arr, arr, arr. You know, Mark, before I found O.J., I couldn't laugh this easily. <laughs> he can do the same for you as he's done for me. Join us, Mark. Follow us to the promised land. San Francisco? Yay, Verily! Candlestick Park! Oh, I see. Believe in ye shall bear oranges. Praise Anita! <laughs> yeah, so, okay, Professor Brown, real, real, real quick. So, I know, you know, you and I, you know, sports fans, definitely basketball fans. What do you think about, like, the athletes with the COVID going back in the NBA? And, like, what do you think that means to the movement? Because a lot of athletes are kind of apprehensive initially going back into playing a, a not a full season but finishing the season for the nba or even going forward into the football season the next football season if it even happens oh, like, I, think, I think i think you know people became complacent you know everybody was making a lot of money everybody was happy and then there'd be little things that would happen to black athletes but it usually just stayed within the team it didn't blow up like the george floyd thing did mm -hmm. and then, uh, there was a guy who played for the Celtics. Can't remember his name. I think he died from a heart attack. Young. I can't remember his name. Oh, uh, you talking about Reggie? Reggie? Uh, Reggie Lewis? It might have been Reggie Lewis. Yeah, because yeah, you know, because Lamb Bias died before. Right. right. You know, so it had to be Reggie. Yes, yeah, Reggie. And he he was looking for a house in Boston. Mm -hmm. He drove, He made the mistake of driving through a white neighborhood, and the cop pulled him over, and he got out the car. You see the guy 6'10", with like, you know, what basketball players, they're like 6'10", 175 pounds. Right. And the cop says to him, boy, where you going? So let me see. We got a 6'10 black guy driving a Mercedes in a white neighborhood. Well, where the hell do you think he's going? You know? <laughs> right. He says, uh, I'm going to look, you know, I want to buy a house on, I don't know, some street. And uh, he said, they're not going to sell you a house around here, boy. Turn your car around and get out of here. Wow. Yeah. But things like that were, you know, things like that get, didn't make the papers. But now, black athletes have realized, just like a lot of black cops, that they are black people too. Mm -hmm. And cops yeah. love fucking black people driving fancy cars because they automatically think they're a drug dealer. They could be pulling out of Madison Square Garden or any any of the, the Warriors Stadium, anything, but they right. just a black man in a, in a fancy car, so he's got to be up to something, or he's got to be a drug dealer. And right. so there's more and more black athletes. And so now that you're responding, that you know, hey, the George Floyd thing can happen to me. The Eric Garner thing can happen to me. Okay. The, uh, what's the guy? The boy's name Isaiah, Isaiah Elijah McCain can happen to me. Yeah. You know, the thing in Minnesota can happen to me. Mm -hmm. And so now the people, you know, these, these guys, the guys who you never thought would say anything about the condition of black people in America, besides LeBron James and, and Stephon Curry, mm -hmm. not everybody's speaking up, you know. Black lives do matter, you know, because mm -hmm. it can happen to me. Professor Frott, I was under the impression that athletes particularly basketball and football athletes were under contract where they couldn't say anything or speak up for injustice so now from what i'm understanding they could i mean i know you're not in the industry per se but based on what you've heard or what you may be familiar you mean to tell me all this time they could have spoke up for injustice but because they thought that what was happening to other black people could happen to them now because of what happened with george Floyd, now they're thinking Oh, this could happen now. They speak regardless. So it wasn't a contract stipulation. It was something they could have been doing. It's free speech. They might not like it, but it's free speech. Mm -hmm. But then there were athletes. There's a few athletes who spoke up and they got 
traded. They didn't renew their contracts. Craig Hodges. Right. Uh, who? Uh, Craig Hodges back in the day on the Bulls. Right. Craig Hodges. Yeah, yeah. Craig back in the 90s. Who, that's the that's the one I remember. I know there's more, but. Who was the big player for the St. Louis Cardinals? Who's the one that started uh, free agency? Uh, Curtis Flood. Kurt, Kurt Flood. Kurt Flood. Yeah, Kurt Flood. Yeah. Right. You know, they blackballed him. Mm hmm. You know, it's all of those people you don't remember anymore. Like, you have to sit around and think about them. Yeah. You know, but now pe these guys, people, everybody's, t people are sick and tired of being sick and tired. Okay. You know, they're what tired of this. Professor Fry, what about the big old Oscar Robinson? Because I read his book, which is a major read, by the way, family. He's from Washington, D.C., right? Huh? He is from Washington, D.C. Who, a big old? Yeah. No, he's from, uh, in he's from Indiana by way of Tennessee, actually. Like he was born, I think, in Tennessee. Then his family moved to Indiana. Uh, I think right outside of Indi Indianapolis, I believe. Some reason he, he was born in Washington. But go on. What about him? Yeah, but just with him in reference of the free agency in the NBA. Like he talks about in the book how him and the Players Association, how they helped to form it, and how they fought for the rights for the players to be like free agents. Right. Well, remember, baseball is the oldest sport, and the one that's the most racist. You know, I mean. They banned black players from what, 1900 to 1947. So they had racism. But the NBA it didn't come into existence until 1947. Mm -hmm. So you know, without the black players, you got no NBA. Mm -hmm. So that so the black players had more have more leverage. But it wasn't like that in baseball. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, America's great pastime. Right. <laughs> So, well, yeah, and he got that with the Negro Leagues. You know, a friend of mine's father, he started a shop uh, down in Nashville, actually, the Negro League shop, um, which tied me into the history a lot more uh, as I was growing up. But, uh, but yeah, the Negro League, you know, like I know they talked about in the 40, uh, the 40, 40 million dollar slave uh, book by William C. Roden um, right. about how they were taking players from the Negro Leagues into the major leagues, but initially they really want to take whole teams they right. want them to buy whole teams but they start picking up the, market. Mm -hmm. the negro league ended up expanding uh Ruba, Ru fosters uh right. owning owning the negro league franchise so let me tell you a, quick, a funny story not it's not, not funny at all i took my father and my father-in-law out for lunch one day over the city island i should have filmed it but that was you know mm -hmm. we were born on one day apart in february 1920. 150 miles apart. My father-in-law was born on the Eastern Shore of Maryland. My father was born in Washington, D.C. They had never really talked that much. I, I think they did, but they never talked about my wife and I were around or we were dating. But I'm sure they did. Together, I asked them, you know, my father used to play, my father played in the Negro Leagues for a minute. So wow. I said to my father, when I was a kid, I said, Dad, when you came home from World War II, why didn't you just go play baseball? And my father looked at me like, are you, are you crazy? <laughs> so I asked him about Jackie Robinson. And both of them, two black men who didn't never saw each other really before in their lives said that racism was so pervasive that, that they thought that the Jackie Robinson experiment would last one year and then baseball would go back to being segregated. Now that's something that we, I couldn't even wrap my. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I just, yeah, just, you know. Like, how could you have baseball without black people? You know? you know? But they had it 47 years without black people. So, you know, it's one of those kind of things. If you never saw it any other way, you wouldn't, you know. Right. Right. True. The Negro Leagues disbanded. That, you know, once television came, that would have been the end of the Negro League because they would have never had the games on TV. Right. Remember, there was only three channels. <laughs> so, and, and it went off at midnight, right? Right. See what I midnight? Damn. You, the night, you didn't even think about turning on the TV because the only thing that was on was the test pattern. <laughs> you know? <laughs> After the late show went off, that was it. They played the Star Spangled Banner, the flag went up, TV went off, that was it. Man, they had, they had a late, late show. <laughs> and actually, 
there wasn't a late show on Channel Two. It was, they played a movie. Mm. The early, no, it's called the early show and the late show. It was a movie. Wow. Right. And it had a, the song was called Sink of oh God, I can't believe I remember this. It was called Sink of the Clock. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> Yeah, that was it. And that was that was that was the theme song. <clears throat> right. I didn't see I didn't I never saw um Gone with the Wind in color until we had a color TV. I always thought the movie was in black and white. They showed it all the time. They said this thing on TV called a million dollar movie. They would show hmm. the same movie, Channel 9. They would show the same movie every day, every evening, 8 o'clock, Monday through Friday. What was this? The same movie. The same one? The same one. You Google it, Million Dollar Movie. Yeah, man. Oh, wow. See, this, see this, but this is why I see, that's why I wanted to have this conversation with you because, again, this, this, these little cultural things, you know, and societal things, you know, that we take for granted now and just, you know, from your era growing up that you remember that we'll be able to say from our era different things and, and younger folks will be looking at us like, what y'all, what are y'all talking about? Like, 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 what's that? Like, you know, so it's, it's generational, but I appreciate it. Um, remember there, was, there was no black radio. There was only two black radio stations and they were both AM. Nobody had FM radio. The only people had FM radio were people who listen to classical music. So the classical music was only on FM, not AM. Nope, it was only on FM. So when did so when did the FM start to get popular? More popular than the AM? Like around nineteen in the early nineteen seventies. Do you know why? Like the switch up. Like all I remember is WBLS and WLIB, which was called WLIB FM, and then it was a jazz station in there somewhere. But that was it. I would have a car with FM radio. My father went to drive the car. <laughs> Why do you have FM radio? Ain't no stations on there. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And I said, yeah, I said, there's, a, there's two black stations on there. He said, no, there's two black stations on AM, WLIB and WWRL. WWRL. Right. And mm -hmm. I WABC, they played white music. They played a mix. They played Motown, Lil James Brown, nothing too radical. And, um, it was 77, WABC played music. I think 10.50 or 10.30 a.m. Played, played music, and that was it. Hmm. And then they used, to have, they, used to have, they used to have an amusement park over in New Jersey, opposite 125th Street. It was called hmm. Palisades Amusement Park. It was the most racist place in America. <laughs> <laughs> what? What? I couldn't wait to go there. My father said, you don't want to go over there. Why don't you think I never took you and your, your brothers over there? He said, but go ahead. <laughs> back, I said, I ain't never going to Palestine. <laughs> 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 man, I, I, can, I can show you, but I can tell you. Go, go right ahead. Now, you <laughs> felt so uncomfortable. You know, like, you know, like, yeah, yeah, you're like, there's, a, there's an alley. And did you hear a voice coming from the, the Richard Pryor says, I heard the voice coming from down the alley, but I didn't go down there. And that, that's what just like Powell said, it was just like a, you know, you just got that feeling. Mm -hmm. they, had a, yeah. they had the biggest 
salt water swimming pool in America. Couldn't go in there. Palisades has the rides, Palisades has the fun. Come on over. Shows and dancing are free, so's the parking, so gee. Come on over. Palisades from coast to coast, where a dime buys the most. Palisades amusement park swings all day and after dark. Ride the coaster, get cool in the waves, in the pool you'll have fun. So come on over. And see, and see, Professor Pride, this is New York. This is New York and New Jersey. See, people when, when people have these type of talks, they talk about Alabama, Arkansas, Tennessee, South Carolina, Mississippi, Georgia. No, this is this is Northeast. This is Englewood, New Jersey, whatever that is. It was, it was above the thing. You can Google it. You'll see it. From People took millions of pictures of it across the river. It was opposite mm -hmm. Viaduct there on, between 135th Street and 125th Street. Mm -hmm. The bus station on 78th Street. Go up there, take the bus over. Once. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. Once was What's your first time? Yeah. Influence um, in teaching. I noticed you were, you, you were giving us your background in regards to how you got into the education field. But was there anyone that influenced you? Uh, anyone in the culture? Yeah, that influenced you. into teaching? No, yeah. actually, I went into teaching by accident. I got a scholarship to NYU, and I just was either paid the money back or become a teacher. <laughs> hey. Well, whatever works. Hey, I know. You know, I wish I, could say, I wish I could say there was some divine intervention or something. You know, you know, I was like one of the stupid black kids that thought I was going to be a professional basketball player. I played in Sweden for a year, you know, and I came back and I, I tried out. I used to play in, the, you know, the pro ams in the park. But you know, one day I woke up and I said, you know, this is it. I'm not going to be it. You know, there's always a guy who's faster can jump higher, shoot better. You know, when you start playing on that level, there's guys that don't miss, you know? I remember playing against Joe Hammond one day, down to Rucker, and you don't talk to people. I don't know what happened. My mouth opened and stupidity came out. <laughs> it was halftime, and I think I had like 10 points and Joe had 16. And I said, yeah, hey, Joe, was he having an off day today? At the end of the game, I think I had 18 points and he had 54. <laughs> Yo, okay. So that's when you learn, you know, I, I, there's a famous picture in the Amsterdam News of Dr. J. Duncan on me. Doc was only a couple inches taller than me, but, but his afro was like five inches taller than me. And um, I'm standing at, at half court on a foul, you know, the guards. When the other team is shooting, when I, when I when your team is shooting, the guard stands at half court to prevent the fast break. If they well, if they miss or they throw the ball down, you can intercept the ball. So I'm standing at half court. Somebody misses the shot. I see everybody jumping to get the rebound. I see this arm go up, <laughs> grab the ball with one hand and bring it down. Out of the pack on the right side of the court comes Doc. So I'm like, big guys can't dribble. By the time he gets to me. I'm going to make him change hands. And if I can't steal the ball, he'll pick the ball up. <laughs> by the time I hit my cranium, we were running side by side to the basket. Side so, by side. He's taller than you. Yeah, and he's yeah. Up with you. Right. No, no. He's dribbling the ball. He's dribbling oh, so fast. And, and he's so taking such big strides that I'm. <laughs> Trying to keep up with him. I'm trying to keep up with him. I said, we just have this thing called meet you at the rim, you know. So he jumped and I jumped. And I could jump. I only weighed 172 pounds then. He jumped and I jumped. And he jumped and I was jumping. So we were like equal for about one, one billionth of a second. And he just went over me. And then... Thank God, you know, when bad things happen, God blocks your memory out. <laughs> All I remember is hearing, Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just getting, I don't even know who y'all talk about, but who who is this? Doc dunked on me in the Rucker. Oh, Dr. J? Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. 
Just so, oh man, the fact you got to play in a rucker though, that's that's classic. I mean, yeah. that's I played on a horrible team. I had like <laughs> oh, on this, I had the only guy who was any good on my team was Bobby Dandridge. Oh, Bobby Dandridge, okay. Everybody else was it was the name of the team was the Vitalis All Stars. <laughs> Vit what? That's the name of the team. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah had, name. Well, so um name kind of sketch. Yeah, it was Luther Rackley who oh, played man. yeah, he, he was he played for uh, Cleveland, then he played for the Knicks, and then he got he went to Philadelphia. He played for this team called the Memphis Tam in the ABA, which is okay. owned owned by Charlie Finley, the guy that owned Oakland. Mm -hmm. I met them at the airport. One day they were playing the Nets. And they had the green and yellow luggage. Ah. Uh, so, so, so Luther's the one that got me to play with him, and then they needed a guard. And Jeff Halliburton, I don't know if you remember him. He went to school somewhere in the Midwest. He got drafted by Philadelphia. He never mm -hmm. went. And I said Bobby Dandridge and a couple other guys. And the Nets, the Nets brought their whole ABA championship squad and they played together and they played together and they played together now professor yeah, that's not Rock, i want to let you know we at the top of the hour okay oh so, geez, I'm sorry <laughs> so is that you want to go 15 minutes more i can go 15 minutes but i'm sorry i got sidetracked no no, okay. no 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 this is this is classic see 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 our, our viewers are from all over so like for us, like for me, this is a treat because you know I'm in the ball and, and especially being in like in New York and then near Harlem and Rucker, like that's that's that go that goes across the nation. Like that's okay. that's like quintessential New York stories that you're right. talking right. about right now. So you have two baskets. They used to have games going on at the same time. The really? Court, yeah, the court used to go. There was two courts going north south, and then I, I was away. They used to play. The Rucker used to be in the St. Nicholas Projects in the court down there on 28th Street. And then really? he moved up to 155th Street. That was before my time. That's when Wilton and all of them used to play. And we used to go down okay. there. But I was a little wow. I was like 11, 12 maybe. And then wow. um, and then they moved up to 155th Street. But they had two courts. And the courts ran on North South. And then I guess I was away or something. And when they came back, they had to sit the court goes east west the same way it does now. Mmm. They switched. They flipped. Wow. Okay. Dang. So make it longer and wider, and put the stands in there. Yeah. Well, and, and, and how was it in those old pictures where you see the people on, or like sitting on the school rooftop <laughs> out the window in the trees? Let me tell you, when the Yankee games used to get out, people used to park. White people weren't afraid to walk through Harlem, and <laughs> they would park on a hundred, like on Saint Nicholas Avenue. So they would have to walk across the Bacombs Bridge and then up the viaduct. And right. they would stand on the viaduct and watch the train before they went home. Wow. That's, how many, that's how, yeah. I, but it I, was, everybody was calm. It wasn't like it is now. You know, hmm. you know there was no fights. Uh, you know, people just, it was a different demeanor. You know, except, <laughs> except for the headline. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they never left. <laughs> that's that's that tradition. That's that like Apollo Rucker. That's that that's that tradition. Like, yeah, we go, we go, we go. You gonna catch an earful before you playing, leave? I was, I was playing in the game at City College, and um, the only thing I remember about the game was uh, what's the guy's name? He sprained his ankle. He had a Showfield, Show Black guy, Showfield, something. He was a good player. I can't remember. Anyway, he sprained his ankle, and I, mm -hmm. I was on the team playing against him, and so. Again, I'm standing at half court. My team is shooting a foul shot, so I'm there to stop the fast break. So I hear somebody from the stand say, Shucks, you ain't shit. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you don't you don't want to you don't want to turn because once you turn, <laughs> you laugh or you turn, you know they got you. Yeah. <laughs> then I had, I had a little bit further, like back over my left ear. I hear somebody else say, "Yeah, and Chuck never was shit." <laughs> <laughs> the brutality, man! Oh goodness! You know, just anything to throw you off your game. Just yeah, just 
they, they have no they have they have man they give zero they give zero <laughs> <laughs> Yo. it's zero. but that's what i love about that rook it's it just you know people on top of people and you know it, it's, it's in your face it's you know there's no way you get it right now with the, they, they didn't have an announcer or anything mm -hmm. at a table and the score and that was it oh wow okay that was it you know and i played against earl and earl manigo um, oh yeah, the gold, yeah, Earl of Pearl. Yeah, Earl, well, Earl, Earl never played in the Rucker. Clyde never really? played in the Rucker. Um, Earl, Earl will come up and watch the game sometimes. Clyde never came up, but wow, uh, Clyde Fra Frazier never came. No, and then he wow. lied. He was being interviewed and he lied. He said, "Oh, I never played during the summer." And then uh, me and Norville and my friend Kevin Presley from Atlanta mm -hmm. we went down to his restaurant and. You know, Clyde used to walk around all the tables. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we stood up to take a picture with him. I got the picture on Facebook. Okay. And Clyde, and Clyde looked at me and says, you know, I never like taking pictures with people taller than me. He's talking about me. Mm -hmm. because, you know, because we're about the same height. Okay. And um, so I said, Clyde, you know, you lied. You said you never played ball during the summer. And then he looked at me. He didn't want to say anything because you know I had him. And I thought, I said, yeah, we used to play ball. He used to go up to State junior high school on 64th Street and Antigone Avenue. And he, like, looked at me funny. I said, I know, because we'd, we'd be going around, because I like playing indoors. They play in the park. So we'd be going around looking for a game. And I said, and you had your Rolls Royce parked down front of the school in the summer. So we knew you was upstairs in the gym playing ball. And then right. I started naming the guys who were up there. And then he was like, well, you know, sometimes. You know. <laughs> But he was playing. But I'll tell you one thing. We were playing together once. Score was 28-20. The game was 30. We we're losing 28-20. Mm -hmm. Some guys, five guys came in the gym to call winners. And Clyde was like, I don't want to sit down. I'm like, well, shit. It's 28-20, and they're taking the ball out. I don't know what the hell you got planned. <laughs> he said, right. harass the guy throwing the, the pass in inbound. He stole the ball five times and mm -hmm. laid it up. In a row, wow. like, they were so scared that he. By the second time he did it, they were so scared that he was going to steal a ball. They damn near gave it to him. <laughs> wow! And we won. And we won thirty twenty eight. Dang! See, that's a, oh wow, that's a story. That's talented. And they never got the it ball. Is. They never got the ball past the, the, the foul off the foul line. You know, bring that's, it up. That's crazy. That's talented. That's 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 very man. Right. So that's, you know, in the park, park games, they don't have any uh, inbound plays or anything. So you're just trying to get the ball to the guy. And yeah. You know, and you know, school gyms are and still is a junior high school, and there wasn't that much room between the end of the court and the wall. In the wall, yeah. So I had, like to stand back. I mean, I didn't go out of bounds, but I was just like jumping around. So the pass was kind of soft. It wouldn't have been like a boom pass, and the guy would have just take and then dribble it up court. So, but I never I. I said, Clyde, man, I got to tip my hat to you. I never saw any shit like that before in my life. And I said, don't be rapping to my girlfriend anymore. He's trying to kick it to one ear. I was like, no, you don't. <laughs> on a sec. I got to get rid of this phone call. Okay. <laughs> The classic stories, family. If you're not listening, you missing out. You missing out. I'm telling you. I mean, this is classic New York stories. This is the, this is one of the great things about uh, being here in the city and hearing like the different stories from folks who grew up here. You know, have uh, lived throughout the different generations. And uh, Professor Fry is definitely one of those people. You know, he's definitely a man about town and cultured and uh, very astute on like just things that are going on in society. So. You know, it's just a pleasure, just like the hitties, hitties story. What do you think, Kaide, man? Like, it's amazing, brother. In fact, I didn't even. I thought Buckers was just just started like in the early eighties. I remember growing up in the Bronx. I tried to go to Buckers. I had friends that ever go to Buckers and stuff like that, but I never knew Buckers has been around that long. It was just, that's that's been around at least since the, as far as I know, the the early the late fifties, early sixties. You know, but I just wasn't allowed to walk down 128th Street by myself, you know, until mm. I was age. Now, mm. Professor Fry, can I ask a question, Cal? Can I throw this question in real quick? Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Fry, you have a lot of these young kids, right, who I ask to this day, 
what do you want to be when you grow up and stuff like that. And I mean, out of 10 of them, probably seven to eight will say they want to be a ball player. They want to be the next LeBron and things of that nature. So we already know it's a, it's a package deal, right? To be the best on the court, but if you don't have that packaging and all that other stuff in there, you're not going to be a LeBron. We already know the percentages of that. How high this question is, is in relation to tuition, right? Tuition? Tuition. About school loan debt and colleges going online with regular tuition fees. What kind, what do you think about that? Do you think like, for example, how do you feel about the school loan debt and the colleges going online with regular tuition fees? Knowing that the tuition is already a home mortgage, uh -huh. right? How do you, what are your thoughts on that? Do you, well, you I mean, know, the colleges just started this, you know, one day nobody had to go to college. And then the next day, everybody had to go to college. <laughs> Mm. Like people say, well, what school did you go to? And you go like, I didn't go to college. Boo! <laughs> yeah. So now everybody feels that they got to go to college. College know this, even though, you know, just I if I if I would rule the planet, I would get rid of half of the majors they have in college because mm. they're useless. They're useless. Mm. You know anybody? Is that you look in the New York Times Sunday help wanted section? You ever see a job for a philosopher? <laughs> nah, I haven't seen one. <laughs> no. In all the places I've been, I've never seen. Right. 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 You know, I never heard a call for an art history major any place, especially if it's Italian art history. You know, don't they have enough Italian art history majors in Italy? <laughs> right. So it's good to have those classes as forced, forced electives. So you have a well-rounded okay. so well education. Mm -hmm. But bring instead of the core being 30 credits or something like that, bring the core down to maybe 12 credits. Or make all of these classes electives. And give mm -hmm. you know, the world change somewhere along the way. It's all about technology now. Mm -hmm. you, know, you have to have reading and writing skills, but you mm -hmm. also have technology skills. And you got to find a school that's got the latest equipment that's going to help you find a job four years from now when you graduate. Damn. Right? So they got to have that stuff. Right? Yeah. How right? Do you, how and, and, right they don't even, I, you know, I took my car to the, the car mechanic. The first thing they did. They plugged it into the computer. Yeah, the diagnostic, yeah. Right. Everything is computer. And I looked at the stuff he was looking at. And I'm going, all I see is these dials going around and stuff going up and down. I said, what are you checking? He said, oh, I'm checking your pre ignition sequence. I'm like, this is a <laughs> <laughs> This is a Ford. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so you got to be prepared what's going to happen four years from now. And, and so, how do you know? You know, I, I don't. I, you know, that's why I say you want bang for the buck. It's nice. To, it's nice to go up to a pre prestigious university and get a, a first class education, mm -hmm. but you have to look at the other end. And the other end is what kind of job are you going to get when you come out? That's why I say I tell students, uh, high school students, this all the time. Your parents have been paying sales tax and income tax in New York State for eighteen years. Mm -hmm. And now you're going to go to school in Pennsylvania so somebody else can take your seat in a school in New York State and pay two-thirds less tuition than you're paying to go to school in Pennsylvania? Mm. Does that make any sense? Doesn't make any sense to me. Wow. Well, so if you can't if, if you can't go to a school that's gonna get you a job in four years where you can make money to pay all those stupid loans back. You're doing the wrong thing, hmm. you know. So now, if you're an athlete, the other thing is, you know, we chase the dream way too far. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we chase the dream way too far. Football players only play four years; they prepare 21 years, or whenever they started playing as a little kid, to play four years in the pros. Wow. Does that, I mean, just look at, it makes no sense. Yeah, the numbers don't add up. The numbers don't equate. Right. 
that doesn't equate. So why why are you why are you putting yourself in all that debt? And remember, you can't declare bankruptcy on your school loans. Those right. things are for the rest of your life. You know. Right. So you want to be somebody living in your mother's basement till you're 35, 40 years old? I know girls, women now, they're not having kids till they're 30, 35 years old because they gotta pay off their school loans. That's that's facts. That's facts. That's fact. I'll be honest, Professor Fire, my generation, we're part of that generation, like where they told us to put school first, and a lot of us put school first. And because of that, families took the back seat. So a lot of my peers, some of them, not all of them, but some of my, uh, a, n- a number of my peers, if we, we're having our families later because it was the whole thing of get your education, get your job. But then they weren't accounting for the loans that we had to pay back. So it wasn't just get out of school and get a job like your generation, like your 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 generation and my parents' generation. Right. Yo, you all were able to go to school cheaper. So yeah, you got the education and then you got the job. And then you be like, okay, well, I'm not paying back school loans. I'm paying my taxes. I gotta pay my car note, my house note. So that money's going to that and building my family. Right. But my generation, we were like, Well, well, damn, we graduated, but we have to pay out school loans before we even think about having like a girlfriend, a boyfriend, a wife, a husband. Right. Yeah, you know, it, it, it got the it, it got put in the back burner. You know, and the one thing that we don't teach our kids, and Mr. Bentley, I like you for this. We have to teach our kids financial literacy from an early age. You know, definitely. I mean, when you had that thing in Chicago last winter, like this past winter, maybe it was I don't know. They had these people online. I know it's cold in Chicago in the winter. It gets brick. On a Sunday afternoon to be online to go into the store Monday morning to buy some new Jordans. Right. Now, how come you never see any white people on those lines? They're there, but they're rare. They're there, though. You know, they're there, but it's, it's rare. You know, we gotta, we gotta keep our keep, teach our children financial literacy. And financial literacy means you got to spend more than you save, and then somewhere along the line, you got to buy property. Property, buy property. Even if you have to move someplace to be able to afford property, you got to do that. Mm. You know, you're not going to be able to buy a brownstone in Manhattan. You know, unless you got a million dollars in the bank, if that. Right. You know, so you move someplace first. First most important thing, the school's good. That's the most important thing. Okay. Okay. You gotta move someplace that's good schools. And you gotta look at the value of the houses. Is the house the, the value of the house increasing constantly? Because you know, a lot of people don't save money, but they use their house as a bank account. Mm-hmm. You know, right? Very good. So you wanna mm-hmm. wanna buy a house or buy some property that the value is increasing. Then you got to find a woman or a significant other. I mean, you, know, you got to say that nowadays. Right, yeah. <laughs> who is going to be your honest partner that you can trust implicitly, who is on the same page you're on. So, you know, you don't go around wearing Converse All Stars and she's wearing, uh, I don't know, LeBron 400s. Yeah, Manolo Blanks uh, with the Louboutins. <laughs> Red bottoms, red right. bottoms. Right. You know, so that you two are on the same page, you're working toward the same goal, and that's what life is about. You know, you take one vacation a year. You know, you don't buy. You know, you don't. You you have one. You have two nice cars, but they don't have to be great cars. Mm-hmm. You know, and you just bank your money. You know, as much as I like working in public school. If I could afford to send my kids to some private schools, I would send them to some private school, not all, because I want them to have the black experience. So, so private school being HBCU, you can send them to an HBCU depending on what. Remember, it's the important thing is that major. You know, That's what are you going to major in that you can find a job in four years? If an HBCU can do that for you. Then that's good. Do they have coding? I don't know what other else. Do you need. That's like the new thing I hear everybody talking about. Yeah, coding. Yeah, computer coding. A lot of these, the coding, I understand. You really don't have to be math. It's more about logic than math, or something like that. It is. It's, it's definitely more logic and math. It's really another language. It really oh. is really learning uh, patterns 
and like say, yeah, logic. Uh, so even if you're not great in math, you can still learn. Mm -hmm. Now, my office at City College, I had these two Asian guys on either side of me. One guy said, you should get an MBA in business or whatever. Mm -hmm. The other guy, the Korean guy, he said, no, that's a waste of money. Get a master's in finance. Mm. He said, because if you have a master's in finance, you can go into business. But you have a master's in business doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be good in finance. That is very true. That is very, very true. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that, that's that, Professor Fry. That's very, that's that. Because I could be running, we run business. Coyote and I run businesses, so we know it's like, yeah, we could get an MBA, and that's not a necessarily a bad thing but if you if we've already been running our business for a number of years we're already learning on the job right mm -hmm. so i said i never and then he gave reasons why they were going they were arguing back and forth <laughs> yeah. you know you know the stupid people used to stand at my door and then they'd be you know front out in the hall. yeah i know yeah <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Uh, i was like oh okay i didn't know that so uh it's funny i was talking to a guy on the phone one day in texas about something and he was getting ready to go back to school and he's going to get an MBA. I said, well, think about getting a master's in finance. And he said, oh, look, he said he was sincere. So I'm going to look into it. I don't know what decision he made. Mm -hmm. but, uh, that's the important thing. You know, we just, you know, I mean, you know, we're descendants of slaves and we still have a little of that slave mentality in us. Yep. You know, and it's, it's hard to, to break it. Yeah. You know, but we got to start thinking differently. You know, you know, we can't keep sending off kids to prison, you know. We just got, you know, we got to stop, you know, we got to, you and Bill Cosby said this, I hate to quote Bill Cosby, <laughs> you got to raise your own kids. You can't let your, your kids' friends raise them and you can't let your kids' friends' parents raise them. You know, oh, I'm going over to so-and-so's house to spend the night. No, you're not. You got a bed here, you know. And Professor, let me, let me chime in. What do we say for the parents that don't know how to raise their children properly because they weren't i guess they weren't raised properly like how do we i don't know how we're going to do about that you know i remember i was watching this tv show and somebody said you need a license to hunt you need a license to fish but you don't need a license to have kids mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anybody can have kids man yeah, right damn Mm. And that's another mm -hmm. life you're bringing into the world that you're responsible for, and you yourself aren't responsible. That's right. the worst atrocity I would think right. is, is, is a part of humanity, man. You know, and yeah. then you see these things on TV the, the boy beat the baby while the mother's at work because the baby wouldn't stop crying and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm not saying he wasn't wrong, but he just doesn't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember hearing somebody say one uh, one time, I think it might have been recently, like, why, why do why do orphanages exist? Like orphan orphanages should not exist in a society. Like an orphanage, like the concept of an orphanage, right. like yeah. should not exist. Yeah. Well, what, were, what what do you do? What does a parent or a, a a a mother who gives birth to a child and can't take care of that child and don't have the support to take care? What is she supposed to do? What and that's the and that's the key question. They were they were basically. The, hanging their premise on the fact that because society is broken down is the fact that orphanages orphan an orphanage would exist but if society will function as properly as it should somebody in the family or, or somebody in the community would take up that responsibility and it would it would, it would not be an issue you know but I, i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm not disagreeing with you but the other problem mm. if you understand financial literacy you won't have children that you can't take care of. Mm. Like in my building, it's two and done. <laughs> they, they never have three kids. <laughs> Christmas Eve baby. There you go. January, mm. March, April, May, June, July. Oh, that's why his birthday's in September. But you know, but they don't. They don't. Two and don't. Right. Because remember, they don't get any services. You know, mm. they don't get food stamps or, you mm. know, okay. salary is too high. 
Okay. Yeah. You know. Okay. Yeah. You know, we accept that. You know, if we stop accepting that, stop having kids we can't afford to have. Yeah. Yeah. You know. And, mm -hmm. and this is the other thing I understand. This is 2020. I've been saying this since 1975. When I was a teenager, there was there was contraceptives, but there was no birth control. So if you wanted a contraceptive, you had to go in the drugstore and buy them. Right. Mm -hmm. And they were always in the back of the drugstore. <laughs> and the, the the wife of the owner of the drugstore, they, they didn't have CVS and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And the wife of the druggist was always at the counter. So you would stick your head in. Oh, man, again. So you would wait until the druggist came out and he was at the counter. Then you rub in, run in, and say, "Oh, I want a bottle. I want a bottle. I want a package of uh, I forgot the, what's the name. They still dead Trojans. I want to try." And then, invariably, he go like, "There's none behind the counter. Hold on, Martha." <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that stigmatization, man. <laughs> like, I'm trying to not be all out, like, trying to be discreet. I'm trying yeah. to be discreet. Yeah, I'm trying to be ten deep. people in the store, they all come down the aisle and go, right. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <It's crazy. laughs> yeah. We at one thirty, man. Yeah. We got yeah. Oh, go. go. um, appreciate this stroll down memory lane. I yeah. wish I could talk about out and work with education. I just don't know what happened. I don't mm -hmm. know. You know, something changed. The, the the link broke. Uh, I don't know if it was uh, parents being too lax, teachers being too lax, or maybe there was a conspiracy. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he said that one of the most dangerous things is an educated black man, black woman. So, right. You know, you know why? Because we always have to be twice as educated. Right. Like people always say, well, why do you always talk about black books? I said, because I had to learn your books and my books, too. Mm. Right. Your history and my history. Yeah. So and if I don't tell you my history, you know, you know, as soon as I talk, talk about my history, like my T-shirt I got on today, it says uh, American since 1619. I had this shirt 10 years before the collars all frayed and whatnot. Yeah. <laughs> I had this shirt right before, uh, what you call it, uh, came up with this idea. Yeah, the 1619 Project, yeah, which is very, I mean, I, 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 got, I, I got on the Langston Hughes shirt that you wear. You know, I, 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 you know, like people argue about, say, American. I said, well, okay, you're American, cool. But well, when did your family come to America? Mm. Uh, like mm. 1908. I said, shit. My family fought in like eight wars for America before 1908. Mm -hmm. said, my family fought in every war that America's been in. Probably, yes. I, I know we fought in the Civil War. I know mm -hmm. we fought in the war against the Indians. I know mm -hmm. we fought in the Spanish-American War. I yep. know we fought in the World War One. Yep. Plus, World like, War Two. Right, right. World War Two, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq mm -hmm. One, Iraq Two. So don't tell me about who's more American. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, Professor Fry, thank you, okay. thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, we got it. We're gonna do a part two, of course, with Professor yeah. Fry. Be ready. We're gonna have to call you back, um, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, more we want to thank you so much for That's sharing with us. Before you go, register yes. and vote. Right. I'm tired of these damn libertarians talking about. Well, there's no difference between Biden and Trump. Okay. Well, who, well, what's going to so they get elected now? So let's say Trump gets elected. Who are you going to run in 2024? Well, we're going to run so and so. The libertarians are going to take off. I said, you dumbasses. If Trump gets reelected, there won't be any elections in 2000. <laughs> <laughs> then what are you going to do? <laughs> Only two percent uh, of Bernie followers have given money to Biden. What are y'all waiting for? Mm -hmm. For Trump to win again, you think Bernie's going to run in 2024? He's going to be like 92 years old. Right? And this is it. You heard it here first. This is this election is it for democracy of any kind in America. You can't see that. You know, the problem with being in the middle of the, the, the hurricane is you don't know the hurricanes around you because you're in the eye of it. Mm -hmm. I put it on Facebook. I really believe this is the beginnings of some kind of civil war. I mean, Trump is sending troops off. 
just he just does unconstitutional shit like it's all right every single day. They yeah, steals money. They don't even care that they're stealing money. They just steal the money, and William Barr says, "Well, all right, they're all right. They, you know, they don't care. This is it. Register and vote. Get mm. all those people who are out in the protesting, throwing the, the stuff back at the cops, and ask them, did you register to vote? I want to see all of y'all in the poll. I don't care if you got to wait on my 15 hours in a snowstorm on November 3rd. We cannot let this man win again. This is it for democracy. This is it. You heard it here first. Mm. Thank you. If you think he's bad now, just wait until uh, Ginsburg dies and he gets to appoint another Supreme Court judge. Wow. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Fry. No, you heard you. that here. Yeah, thank you. You heard it here. Vote. Get out and vote. Definitely. Uh, yeah, be a part of the solution, family, not the problem. Stop complaining right. and do something about it. If, right. you, if, you feel that, if you feel that strong about it, even if, even if you say, well, I'm not voting. Okay, well, you know, that's your that's your prerogative, but it affects all of us. But if you're not going to do that, get out and be active. Do, you got to do something. Right. You know, you can't be sitting right. behind talking, talking garbage right. and talking. Right. Vote for Trump. Not voting. Right, it's a vote for Trump. Yeah. That's how you got elect. Well, got it. Just vote. Just vote. Yeah. That's a whole other conversation for like an yeah. hour. Um, but my hand was on Babadu Legit at Twitter. And Instagram, I'm on YouTube at Kaya Day Bentley. I'm also on YouTube at Perspective TV. We have one-to-one -one discussions on uh, uh, career and things of that nature. And Candidate Advisor, where I give advice on career development and things of that nature. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. I learned a lot from Professor Fry. This brother is hilarious. I didn't even know he played basketball. He played the Clyde Crazy. <laughs> Kept the, kept the team on 28 while they got to 30, and they were down to 20. This was this guy, man. I mean, thank you, Kyle, for bringing like these intellectuals on here because you're bringing a part of my network, and I'm learning so much. So, Professor Fry, mm -hmm. I thank you. I can't thank you enough. I look forward to a part two to learn more from you. Uh, those are my handles, Kyle. Your turn, and then we got to give it over to Professor Fry. You know, get first vote again, vote again, vote again. Make sure we. On you. Indeed, indeed, family. So yeah, thank you for watching, family. This has definitely been a worthwhile discussion uh, with Professor Fry. And here's my handles that you can come and follow me or see what I'm going through, see what I'm, what's going on with me. And that's D-I-X underscore K-Y-L-E on IG, Instagram, K-E-Z-773, that's K-E-A-S-Y 773 on Twitter. And then on YouTube, Mr. Kyle Dixon. And of course, you know, the Grand Rise Collective Facebook page. If you're on Facebook, come check us out. Come like, subscribe, share, all those things, right? So those are my handles, family. Um, and Professor Fry will end with you. Where can they reach you if they have questions or if they are? Uh, uh, you don't want to reach me because I'm sure the FBI, the CIA, is, they're, they're not doing anything. My yeah. very little because I know they're watching me because when they come, they're going to come strong. Yeah. You know, this is no joke. We're not. This is. You know, I laugh and joke and whatnot. But this is, this is serious now. It is. It is. It is. You know how you know how, you know how, you know how black folks do. We we laugh to keep the crowd. Right? Right? Serious business though. Right. It you is. remember when the Dixie chick said they should apologize to President Bush? You know. Yeah. You know. Yeah, that was crazy. So how about? How about this? How about this? If you need to reach Professor Fry. You can reach or just contact Kyle. Kyle will relay any message that right. you may have. Right. From your right. That's how we do it. Professor Fry, listen, listen, listen. I don't, I don't take the stuff that's going on here lightly. I know it's crazy, um, but I laugh and try and give people that laughter to be able to cope with it as a mechanism. Yeah. But don't be misunderstood. I know the stuff out here is crazy. Right. And I'm doing funny. what I can. You know, you know, we laugh. It's not, you know, sometimes you laugh to keep from crying. Yeah. Right. You know. Yeah. And some of it's so absurd. You just like, I just can't. You know, my, I just. It's it's one. It's like a. Sometimes it's a nervous reaction, but sometimes it's like, wow, it's just so funny. It's just so absurd. Like when you talked about earlier with the with the record labels, the names of like the four tops, the temptations, and just the record listings of the song, the song titles. Just so when the when the white children take it home to listen to it, their parents not going to have a conniption fit. Like these are things that actually happen. This is part of that culture that 
has birthed a lot of this hatred and people wonder like why are these cops doing this and why are these uh, white supremacists racist in certain cities acting this way because of this history these these small things led up to big things and like professor fry saying you all if we don't handle the small things now the stuff that we like oh it'll get better oh you know it's not that bad he's saying no it will be bad if not for you children it will be bad if you don't take care of it right now mm -hmm. all right and Trump yeah. you know. indeed indeed so family again thank you thank you for watching thank you for hanging with us thank you for listening uh, we really appreciate your time. We really appreciate your comments. And please leave comments down below. Uh, please like, share, and subscribe to our channel. We're trying to get about 1,000 subscribers by September. Uh, again, for those people who have subscribed, thank you very much. Those who have liked and shared, thank you very much. We appreciate you. Uh, we appreciate the energy and the love, and we give it right back. And uh, stay with us. Stay tuned. And we'll be back for another episode. But until then... Peace. Power. 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 <laughs>